Listen up, soldier. This is OPBR School. You are here to learn how to act on the field. I will not tolerate any individual selfish actions out there. We will work as a team to win this war. You got that? Yes, yes sir. sir. Good. So today we will be talking about offense, but you need to remember what we learned in the last lesson because this is not American football that we're playing. You gotta keep defense in mind. Because defense was all about you doing the right decisions to keep your position safe. But offense will be all about exploiting your enemy's errors. Remember that going on the offensive is inherently dangerous for you because it creates those exact errors that you are trying to exploit onto your enemies. In other words, defense is safe but offense is risky. But you can't win a war if you're not willing to take risks now can you? But first, let me ask you this. Who on the team is the best build to lead the attack? If you said the attacker, you are dead wrong. It is the runner that has the potential to put the most pressure on the enemy team. The runner on your team is the commander on the field. He is the one that calls the shot. A well coordinated attack revolves around the runner's decision making and the rest of the army has to maneuver around him. Because remember that the main goal of an attack is to capture and then secure a position. Now since offense is all about exploiting the enemy's errors, we will look at the most common cases to identify the opportunities, figure out how to exploit them and also how to induce them. Alright, it's time to look at some maps. As a reminder, squares are defenders, circles are attackers, and triangles are runners. Okay, so we can see here that the enemies in blue are gathered on mid. A good runner here would not go to mid where all the fight is happening, but would go either for the D flag or the E flag, which are both completely free. Now we saw in the last lesson that the E flag and D flag are not as important to your team. So the D flag is way more important and that's why the, the runner in this example will go to the D flag. We'll cover the E flag in another case. Now from here there are three possible outcomes. Outcome one, the enemy doesn't react and you cap the flag. This is obviously the best outcome, but there's someone that needs to go and guard that treasure. And that person is not the runner. That person is either an attacker or a defender. Now, there is no point in capping a flag if that flag is not going to be guarded. If the flag is capped back by the enemy immediately, all of you done is basically nothing. So, you need to guard that flag. And remember what we saw in the last video, if you manage to guard this flag, this will create a lot of pressure on the, onto the enemy. The responding enemies will tend to gather up on that flag and therefore will create more gaps in their position which leads to more open flags for your runner. Outcome 2. Here, one enemy reacts to go guard the back cap. This is the correct reaction from the enemy. On your team, one attacker needs to go help out the runner. With superior numbers, you should be able to get the flag, which leads back to outcome one. The attacker stays on the flag to defend it, and the runner can go put some pressure somewhere else. If a second enemy comes and help out when the attacker joins, then their defense is successful. All that's left is for you to beat them with superior skills and maybe matchups. Outcome three. More than one enemy reacts to go guard the back cap. This essentially spreads out the defenses too thin, and this will be covered in more detail in case 2. But, what this means is that the mid flag, which is the most important flag, is less well guarded. So, the runner's job is going to be to stall the two enemies or more that are attacking him, while the other three allies are going to hit hard on mid as quickly as possible because the superior numbers are on mid right now, you, so you need to hit mid hard and fast. Now this is one of the most effective tools a runner has to create opportunities for his team. Not for himself, for his team. So it's very important to understand it, because it can be used either offensively but also defensively. However, there's one thing that is even more important than this, and that is for you to subscribe to this channel. Hey, 500 subscribers before the end of the year, can we make it? We're doing a huge giveaway if we do, so click that subscribe button. <laughs> Alright, back to topic. Uh, the trap can be induced when the guard of the back cap is unor unorganized and more than one enemy defends it. So this leaves either mid or the second flag less well guarded, depending on which flag that your team is pressuring. We saw an example of how it's done with their second flag in case 1, but here we'll look at how it's going for the base flag. The biggest difference here to keep in mind is that when the runner goes for the base flag, the runner does not need any assistance. And why is that? Because the base flag is the least important flag to defend, 
which means it's also the least important flag to cap. So the goal here is not to cap the flag and, and, and then secure it, here is to cap the flag in order to distract and create chaos. So even if you don't manage to get to cap the flag, you're still doing a job here. By distracting the enemies away from the most important flags, the runner is creating opportunity for the rest of the team. We've seen in the last video how this can be used defensively. If you're interested, go check it out. So, how do we do it? First of all, you need to wait until they push out. Do not go in there when they are respawning or when they are right next to the flag, especially if there are a lot of enemies. Because this gives you one, it gives you higher chances to cap the flag, and although it's not your main goal to cap it since you're not going to defend it, capping the flag is still the best way to distract them because it forces them to react to it, and it's a good way to stall them and waste time. Second of all, it makes the other team make more decisions when they were pushed out. And third of all, it puts them on the back foot, which is good for your team. So this is a bit difficult to wrap your head around, so we'll give an example to explain this. So let's say here that two enemies respawned and are going to mid where all the fight is happening. The runner now goes for the backup. One of the enemies reacts, turns around and starts to go back, but BAP! He gets hit by a Kambusari. The second enemy therefore realizes that his ally got knocked down and starts to go back as well, because otherwise the flag will just be capped. Here, two decisions had to be taken by the enemy to guard the flag. Every time the enemy has to take a decision, it's an opportunity for them to take the wrong one. For example, on the first decision, instead of one enemy turning around, maybe two of them start to go back. And this is a win for you because the mid is going to be less well guarded. On the second decision, instead of one enemy reacting to the ally being down, maybe no one reacts. And that's something that happens a lot. On top of that, having to go back to spawn is something that is annoying which is something that you can use to your advantage as a runner, and it's easier for your team to push when you, the enemies have their backs facing them. Now compare this to going for a backup when somebody is already on the flag. Here there's no hard decision to be made by the opponent, one person just stays on the flag and guards it. Now this is what should happen in theory. In practice, the opponents will often both stay there and guard it, but this is not something that's reliable against smart players. Sometimes you try to go for a backup trap, but the enemy doesn't react the way you want them to. Now you need to know which situations are good for your team and which are not. And if they're not good for your team, give up on that plan and try to do something else. Ideally, you want to distract two, maybe three enemies, but not more, because you need to survive for as long as possible. If you die within 5 seconds, your team is not going to be able to capitalize off of that. And it's way easier to hold off two enemies for 20 seconds than it is to hold off four enemies for 10 seconds. As a matter of fact, you're actually hurting your team if you die too quickly, which is going to be the theme of case 3, which we will cover soon. Now this tactic can still be useful, although less powerful, if you only distract one enemy, but this is only viable in very specific situations, which are, you are losing and you are distracting the defender on their base flag. Because when the enemy team is winning, they have more flags, the defender wants to be on mid where he's, he's the most useful, it's their strongest defensive unit. The other situation is, you are winning and you are distracting the runner on the base flag because the, the runner on their team has the most offensive pressure onto your team. So basically, you take away the strongest defensive unit when they need to defend the most and you take the strongest offensive unit when they need to attack the most. This is what happens when the enemy runner didn't watch this video and tries to back up when the whole team is waiting there for him. He's going to get ganged up and die way too quickly. Now listen carefully, ganging up is not good for you 95% of the time because it creates open flags everywhere. But what makes this strategy viable is speed, because speed here is extremely important. If you take too long to kill the enemy, they are the ones that are doing a backup trap onto you. But if you kill them quickly, the enemy won't be able to profit off of that and you'll have a short window of time where the enemy is respawning where you have a numerical advantage. During that window, you need to attack the enemy and this has to be done also very quickly because as soon as the respawning enemy comes back, your advantage is gone. Sometimes you can provoke the enemy into overextending. Remember how I said that going back to the spawn is annoying for the enemy and that the runner can use that? Well, if the enemy is very annoyed, he'll start to chase the runner down and the runner just has to run back to his teammates. A little bit of chasing is fine, but if you chase too much, you risk getting ganged up upon. 
What can sometimes also happen is that two enemy are overextended. If you manage to kill them both very quickly, you have a numerical advantage that is absolutely huge. It's like you have a team boost all of a sudden and you can just trample over the enemy, but you need to execute this fast enough. This is exactly how reverse 5-0 usually happens. It's because the enemy tries to force a 5-0 in a situation where there is no opportunity. Alright, that's it for today folks. Make sure to leave a like, a comment and subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!